Today's message is called The Exchange. And what we see here today is an exchange. It's an exchange of our faith with a crown. Please lean into the story this morning. Uh, you might be at home. I know it's a gorgeous day outside, but this story is powerful for us Christians. It is just a reminder of Jesus' great love for us. And we really got to lean into it. Let your heart be moved by what you see and read and hear this morning. All right. Well, Mark 15. Mark 15 paints a very poor picture of humanity. We see it as the pinnacle of human deceit and deception, for there are no justifications. There are no righteous motives for what we see that people do here today. And as we unpack the brutality along with the, of the crucifixion, along with the deception, there's only one thing that, that you and I can do besides cry out as, as Jesus does with his final breath. And that one thing in the midst of all of this is to allow our hearts to be filled with gratitude and love, to allow ourselves to taste and cherish the lengths in which our great and holy God went to in order to restore us, you and me, to himself. It is the great reversal, the great exchange. But Mark 15 is about more than just the crucifixion. Today's passage, it also asks something of us, and that is that we respond in kind. We respond in kind. We respond with the love and obedience that we see of the one who sacrificed himself so that we may exchange our faith for a crown. Yes, today we're, I'm just going to tell the story of the old rugged cross. And yes, Harry's going to lead us in singing of that one towards the end of my message. So just hang on for that. It is, it is a beautiful, timeless hymn. I'm certainly looking forward to it. But first, let's just pray with me and then we're going to unpack this passage. All right, Lord. Loving Father, we, we, we cannot fully understand your ways, but we can receive your love. So Lord, please fill us with your love, with your compassion, one for another and for you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I've got two questions for us today. Who do you say Jesus is? Clear and obvious question that this passage asks of every person who walks the earth. Who do you say Jesus is and how does your re life reflect his? I know we see what he does and where he goes. How do we reflect that kind of sacrifice, that kind of love in the way we treat each other and ourselves? It's a big challenge. All right, let's have a look at the text. Today we are... Uh, we we begin with the trial of Jesus before the Roman governor Pilate. And the reason for this trial, the justification for taking Jesus before Pilate, is based on his response to the high priest in our previous chapter. So let's just look at that quickly first. So this is Mark 14, verse 61. And the high priest asks Jesus, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? In other words, are you the one who will launch a rebellion against Rome? Are you a threat to Rome? Are you the one who, who speaks for God, who claims to be God, a threat to them? And then Jesus answers, I am. Now, these are the words spoken from the burning bush, only words that God can speak of himself. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven to which the high priest tore his clothes now tearing of one's clothes this this ripping open of one's garments not something we do right no but it's it was a visual display of disgust in an offense towards God and in this case it was the offense of of may of what the high priest saw as a blasphemous claim Jesus drawing equality with God and the ripping of the clothes it meant that the high priest was his mind was made up and that he was not only justified in calling for Jesus' death, as he, he does now, but now, because of this public display, his own honor and pride was at stake. He had to carry through. He had to walk this path at all cost. But our high priest has a problem, right? The Jews under Roman rule were not permitted to carry out the punishment of death, of capital punishment, a crime that, that Jesus had now committed, apparently, and, and a and a and a punishment he now deserved. So this display of anger and disgust, this passing of judgment, it would be for nothing. It would be impotent. Or worse still, it would be an embarrassment 
if he could not convince the governor to kill Jesus. A governor who cares not for the charge of blasphemy. I mean, why would he care less if one Jew's complaining about another Jew, what they say about God, a God he doesn't care for or believe in? I mean, Caesar was his God, right? He wouldn't care. But there are things this governor does care about. There are reasons why he would sentence someone to death. For example, challenging the honor, the kingship of Caesar. (laughs) It was a crime worthy of death. Of course, fighting back, causing an insurrection. Again, a crime worthy of death. And it's these two things that the chief priests have crafted to kind of pin on Jesus. With the first being his challenge over Caesar as king. And of course, they twist it. For Jesus is claiming a different kind of kingship. But that matters not. For it is his claim to be king over Caesar. The claim to challenge Caesar's kingship over the Jews. It is this that Pilate does care about. It's this is the crime of treason. And Pilate does care that there might be another Barabbas who we're going to find out in a minute. Is there another one in our midst? Is he about to launch an insurrection and, and overturn Rome? Pilate does care. So he questions Jesus. Chapter 15, verse 2. Are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. That's an odd way to reply, isn't it? The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Pilate was amazed. Why? Because Pilate's used to people groveling at his feet for their lives, right? Begging him for their very lives. And Jesus did something that wasn't expected. He refused. To fight for his life, which is odd, being on death row and all. But not only this, he appealed unmoved by the trial. Unmoved. Something that clearly shifted Pilate's thinking in Jesus' favor. And our chief priests, now facing a possible defeat and serious embarrassment, they appeal to Pilate's second weakness, and that is the will of the crowd and the possibility of an insurrection. A crowd that was stirred up by this trial and these accusations of blasphemy by the chief priests and the potential release of Barabbas, because we must remember that is likely why they were there. There, have a look at verse 8. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. It was the custom that Pilate would release someone at these great events. It was a way to win over the crowd because they love the applause. I mean, we we know about the Colosseum and all that. It's a bit like the Hunger Games, you know, give people a carrot, (laughs) a bit of hope and they will worship you. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing that it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. Clearly it's sarcasm, right? We see that Pilate had decided that Jesus may well be a troublemaker for the chief priests, but he was no threat to Caesar. He was no threat to Rome. But the chief priests stirred up the crowds nonetheless, and they decided and to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. Now again, Barabbas' followers are in the crowd, and it is likely they'd already planned to ask for his release. But ironically, Barabbas is a freedom fighter, a robber, a robber, a murderer. From their perspective, this this murderer was more of a messiah than the sacrificial teacher, healer, known as Jesus. He was more of a messiah, a messiah, more of a savior than Jesus was. How can they be so short-sighted? How could this be true? Surely they're not seeking another Caesar in their midst. Surely that's not what they're after. To which Pilate responds in verse 12. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him, wanting to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. What a horrible turn of events this is. And to mention that this kind of injustice, innocent suffering that we're about to witness, it is perhaps the hardest of all crimes to stomach. 
And on that note of innocent suffering, we have no, we have no good answers as to why God allows suffering. But we do know that our God suffers with us. And that's what we see here today. In verse 16, it's gut-wrenching to read. And its purpose, we can only assume, is to perhaps satisfy the crowds first for blood and punishment and so-called justice. Perhaps if they were satisfied, they might let this innocent man go free. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. Theologians think that's two, three hundred odd soldiers. It's a big crowd nonetheless. They gathered around giving Jesus a beating. They put a purple robe on him then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. This man healed people. This man spoke wise and loving words towards so many. And again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The chief priests, Pilate, the crowd, now the guards, began with Judas. They'd all taken authority over this man, condemned him to death. How can this be? How can one so righteous, how can one so innocent be treated this way? How can one so strong and so wise and so powerful fall so hard? But it's a reminder, is it not? It's a reminder that when the world and even our friends and fat, they mock Jesus and us by proxy. It's a reminder of how we Christians, how we fight our battles. We fight our battles with sacrificial love. Yet this is only the beginning because next they strip him of his clothes and nail him to that cross. Yes, Jesus, our Messiah, the one we worship, our Lord, beaten, bloodied, nailed to that cross, naked. Why? Why? Why can't he save himself? He's so powerful, so strong. Well, verse 32, they ask him that very question. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, Come down from the cross that we may see and believe, they said. Even those crucified with him heaped insults at him. Come down from that cross so we may see and believe. Would that really convince us if Jesus came down from that cross? Would that really be what we need and what we seek? This is a dark time both figuratively and literally. Have a look at verse 33. At noon, that's midday, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Eclipses do not last three hours. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sababathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the so much more than the cry out of an innocent man, beaten, nailed, stripped bare for the sins of others. And we know this because of his language. My God, my God, he cried out. For this is the only prayer of Jesus where he doesn't use the word Abba. Abba is the word we translate as daddy. He normally speaks of God as daddy, personal and close. That intimate relationship only a true son can have. But here he doesn't. He uses God. God as if he's accepted his role as son and sacrifice. And the inevitable separation that he would take place from God that is to follow. A separation because Jesus knows that a holy God cannot look upon sin with love and acceptance. But Jesus has not sinned. Jesus does not deserve the punishment that, that is before him. And this I cry out, as I'm sure you do with me. Yet we know from his prayer in the garden, we know that he has accepted his role as the lamb, a sacrifice of sin and shame. And the pain, the pain ravished upon Jesus here is the greatest pain of all. And I'm not talking about the beatings. You and I, we have been through stuff. 
All of us have. But what we see here in this moment is the greatest suffering of all. It is separation from God. Yes, this is the greatest. This is the most scary, the most fearful truth spoken of the, against those who would reject Jesus. For this is separation that all who refuse him will share. And they will share it for all eternity. How a person could bear such a thought or the reality of such a thing, I do not know. For Jesus himself cries harder in this moment than he did when Judas betrayed him. When Peter turned his, when Peter turned his back on him, denied him three times. The beatings, the floggings, the trial, all of it. And yet in this moment, this moment of suffering, it is the moment that we rejoice in the most. I know it sounds sadistic. But this act of love, it is to restore what we break every time we sin and disobey God. It restores us to God. I don't deserve the gift that comes as a result of what Jesus has endured. You don't deserve this gift. None of us deserve it. For in this moment, Jesus carried your sin and my sin into the grave. In this moment, Jesus made us right with God. He made us righteous. <laughs> what a gift this is. The Lamb of God, leaving his glory above to pardon and sanctify me. Now that's a line from the song, The Old Rugged Cross. And we're going to, Play that right now. Just lean into these lyrics. Enjoy it. It is a powerful song of praise. On a hill far away Stood an old rocket cross The of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my true at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish trophies at the style lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine beauty I see for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I cross 
promise I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. There was a giant curtain that rested between, in the temple between the holy place and the people. Only the high priest was permitted to enter that place, the dwelling place of God where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And here in this moment, that curtain was torn, opening up a way for every single one of us to enter God's presence, to be with him in eternity. And when a centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This man was the son of God. This man enables us to exchange our faith for a crown. This man is exactly who he says he is, the great I am. But friends, this centurion, it is, it is likely that he participated in Jesus' death. Not just this, but the floggings, the mocking and the spitting. This centurion, this soldier, his words are nothing short of a miracle. This is the biggest backflip, the biggest turnaround in all of history for this proud and this soldier to acknowledge not just the, own, the horror of his own sin and shame and what it has done, but of who Jesus is and what he came to do. This is a miracle. It is a miracle. It is a miracle that we can share. It is a miracle for you and me. It is a miracle that angels rejoice at. And you know what I'm going to say next. You know how I'm going to close this morning. Who do you say he is? Who do you say he is? What do you say happened on that cross? Is it an emblem of suffering and shame? Or is it a symbol of hope, forgiveness and love? And will you one day allow it to be exchanged for your crown? Will you take the biggest backflip of your life and turn to Jesus, receive what God offers on that cross? Forgiveness. It's not an easy thing to do. And we don't do it because of the alternative. We do it because it's the truth. This man is who he says he is. And this man is calling your name. Someone listening and watching this morning, perhaps you've drifted from God. You've drifted from the church. Perhaps that's you. Jesus is calling your name. It's time to return. Time to come back and exchange your faith for a crown. But it's more than that, as Tim hinted before he read the Bible this morning. It's about sharing that faith. We don't want to be solo Christians. We don't want to have crowns all by ourselves. We want a great multitude of people to join in this great kingdom. And that's our responsibility. To tell our friends to share this love and this hope. To sacrificially love as Jesus did. We will exchange that faith for a crown. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God's forgiveness. And if you want to join in on my prayer this morning, you only need to say amen. Because if you say amen, it means you agree. You agree. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your great love. We thank you that you died on that cross for us. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for our times when we've gone astray, from when we've deviated from the path. Lord, we pray, bring us back to you. We are sorry. Forgive us and give us that crown. In Jesus' holy name. Amen.